Good morning and welcome to the CCIC San Jose worship service. Thank you for your faithfulness to attend worship through the internet. During this viral pandemic, it is more important than ever to keep our focus, hope and faith in the Lord our God. In Philippians 4 verse 6 and 7, it states, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let us pray and present our request to God. Heavenly Father, we are here this morning to worship and honour you. You alone deserve all glory, honour and praise. You are the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. You are the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You are the Prince of Peace and Master over all creation. Your grace and mercy is the only way we can approach your throne. We come before you with humble and anxious hearts, for you are our comforter. As we shelter at home due to the virus, you are the rock of our salvation. Our lives are disturbed in so many ways, but you are our Jehovah Jireh. Our schools and workplaces are shut down, but your throne and loving arms are always open. Some of us and our loved ones are ill, but you are our healer. As the pandemic continues to spread, you alone have everything under control. We pray for your mercy during this period. May the pandemic quickly pass and may the recoveries begin. May this be a time for more people to seek your comfort and to surrender their lives to your Lordship. Even as we shelter at home, we pray for all our congregation members to be healthy and to remember those who may be alone and isolated. For each ministry at CCIC, we pray that the leaders and members will find creative ways to reach out to one another, to stay in touch, to comfort and encourage each other, and to support and pray for everyone. May we grow closer as a church family as we learn to trust in your will. For we know that all things work for the glory of your kingdom. Heavenly Father, in Isaiah 41, verse 13 and 14, you said, For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, for I myself will help you declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Dear Lord, we claim your promise to help us. We confess that we are anxious and afraid because we sometimes lack faith. Renew our faith, O Lord. May we sing your praises with joy in our hearts forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we share a special virtual communion through the internet. Praise God for technology that allows us to do this from wherever we are. For those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior and have been baptized, please get your elements now as we will need them shortly. If unleavened bread is unavailable, you may use any kind of bread or crackers. For the cup, please prepare some juice or wine. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please watch us for a few minutes. We look forward to the day when you will be able to partake the elements with us. Jesus introduced the Holy Communion during the Last Supper. In Luke 22, the Bible states, And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As Jesus described the symbolic significance of the bread and wine and his impending suffering, he was demonstrating his utmost trust and obedience in the Father. After dinner, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. His darkest hour was approaching. Jesus prayed so fervently, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He asked the Father if this cup of suffering could be taken away from him. Ultimately, Jesus submitted himself before the Father, saying, Not my will, but yours be done. 
he willingly suffered and died for us. Today, our lives are filled with uncertainty and fear brought upon by the COVID-19 virus. We are ordered to shelter at home. The stock market has crashed. Some of us have lost our jobs. Some have fallen ill. But yet, we have reason to rejoice. Our Heavenly Father loves us so much that He sacrificed His only begotten Son for us. We rejoice because Jesus conquered sin and death on our behalf. We have the peace of Jesus as our eternal light and hope. We can have faith that God is on the throne and He will guide us through this difficult period. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you with humble and thankful hearts. We remember your sacrifice on the cross for us. Your body and blood was payment for our sins. As we place our hope and focus on you during this challenging time, may the Holy Spirit reassure us that your grace is enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us partake the elements together. And now, Elder Jimmy Lee will be presenting this week's sermon. He will be continuing the series on integrating faith with life. Morning. I'm glad you could join us online for worship this morning. Even though we are not physically together, our heart and spirit are united as one in Christ. We've been going through a preaching series 2020 vision since the beginning of this year. You may have been with us the past few months you are familiar with our vision statement as shown on this slide. We are an intergenerational church that invites others to follow Jesus Christ, invests in one another's discipleship journey, and integrates faith with life by the power of the Holy Spirit for God's glory. We have talked about three, the first three eyes, an intergenerational church, inviting others to follow Jesus Christ, and investing in one another's discipleship journey. Last Sunday, we began talking about the fourth eye, integrating faith with life. We want to explore what it looks like to integrate our faith into our daily lives and learn how to practice that. For example, how do we connect our faith with our school life, our work life, and our family life? And how can we, our faith, uh, help us to have a healthy relationship with other people to resolve conflicts or to live a balanced life. And as much of the world, including us in Silicon Valley, is gripped with the fear and anxiety because of the coronavirus, how can we have peace in the middle, in the midst of this storm because of our faith? So I hope this series of integrating faith with life will lead us to apply scripture and integrate faith with our, with our everyday uh, lives. And last Sunday, Pastor Bruce uh, talked about the marks of a person who integrate faith with life from someone. He encouraged us to be rooted in the word of God, taking delight and meditating on the word of God. Today, we'll be looking at a biblical model of integrating faith and life from Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. So let's read this passage together. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ with your life appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, 
which is idolatry. On account of this, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which has been renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not great Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Sicilian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on them as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has complained against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful that the word of Christ dwell in, in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. So I believe we all struggle with uh, integrating faith with life. There are at least two common problems that we need to uh, overcome. The first problem is the sacred secular divide. This is a pervasive problem among churches and believers. The sacred and secular divide leads to a compartmentalized life. Faith is not connected with work, with our school, leisure, or everyday life. Faith becomes a, a Sunday or a church thing. The dis disconnect produces a sense of frustration, disorientation, contradiction, and dissonance. The second problem is to try to uh, you know, we try to integrate faith with life with a legalistic approach. We focus on do's and don'ts. But Colossians uh, chapter 2 tells us that observing rules and rituals cannot stop the indulgence of the flesh, evil thoughts, and sinful desires. An external approach leads to a dead end. So how do we integrate faith with life? Let's see what the passage teaches us. There are three key practices that can really help us to integrate our faith with life. The first practice for us is to embrace our new identity in Christ. When I say identity, I mean the instinctive picture of ourselves that we carry around inside us. So here in verse 1, it says, if then or since then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Then verse 2 or three, two and 3 says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's pay attention to what it says here. We have died and we have been raised with Christ. Our deaths and been raised with Christ have already happened. When we first believe and receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, our, self, our old self died with Christ and we were given a new life in him. This message is repeated throughout the New Testament, especially in uh, Paul's letter. For example, in uh, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. 
It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, I'm not the same old Paul. That old Paul died with Christ. Now, the new Paul is living. My new identity is that I died with Christ, and now I live in him, and he lives in me. This is not only a true for Paul, but it's true for all believers. So here is another example. You probably know what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old has passed away. This is who we are. There are many other passages in Romans, you know, Ephesians, Corinthians, Titus, and so forth, that the same passage, the same message uh, is emphasized over and over again. So here in uh, verse 1 to 4, Paul wants us to drive these truths deep into our hearts that we have died with Christ and have been raised with him. Today, we who receive Christ have a new life in us, a new spiritual life born of the Holy Spirit. This life is hidden with Christ in God. It cannot be seen by physical eyes, but it is real. God wants us to see ourselves as a new creation in Christ. The old has gone. The new has come. And not only that, here in verse 4, tells us that we have, a, we have a glorious future that will appear with Christ in glory. God called us to have an eternal perspective and a living hope that no matter what kind of failures we had in the past and what difficulty we face now, we have a glorious future with Christ in eternity. So my question for you is, do you believe that you are united with Christ in his death and resurrection? Do you, do you no longer see yourself, see your old self, but see the new creation you are in Christ? In this world, we tend to find identities in our, in, uh, find our identity in, in what we do, you know, how, how we perform, uh, what we have, uh, what other people say about us, and what we desire. If we identify ourselves with our career and what we spend like 40, 60 hours a week to do, then we each define and think of ourselves as, I'm my work. I'm what I produce. I'm a software, enge software engineer, or I'm a teacher, or I'm a full-time mother. Based on how I perform, how well I do, and others' opinions of me, then we put labels on ourselves. I'm a good doctor. I'm a poor manager. I'm a responsible teacher. I'm a straight A student. Or whatever your identity might be, we also find who we are by what we have or what we lack. I'm a billionaire. I wish I, I do. I'm a popular person, or I'm the least loved in a family. But that's not how God defines who we are. We're not, you are not your job, your looks, your performance, your desire, or even your past. The true you is how God sees you and who he says you are. The things we do, what we have, what we want, how we perform, may and will change, but our new identity in Christ will never change. So in this passage, Paul wants us to know at least three truths about who we are. In verse three, it says we have died with Christ. We are no longer who we, who we were. And then verse one says, now we have been raised with Christ. Verse three, our life is hidden with Christ in God. And in verse 12, we are God's chosen ones, forgiven, 
holy and beloved. This is who we, who, who we are. And then in verse 4, we will appear with Christ in glory. This is who we will be. So the glory of Christian life and the secret of his power and joy are in these three truths about us. Now, how we uh, apply these truths about our new identity in our uh, everyday lives. How do we respond in, how are we responding to the current coronavirus uh, pandemic? Much of the world is gripped by fear and anxiety as COVID-19 spreads. How does embracing our new identity in Christ help us to have peace and security instead of fear and anxiety? Well, in uh, verse one to four, here it reminds us that Jesus is with us. He is in us and we are in him. In the midst of this pandemic, remember that we're in union with Christ and he is in control. Nothing will happen that he doesn't allow to happen. The Gospels record a story that the disciples were with Jesus in a boat. Suddenly a big storm came and waves swept over the boat. The disciples were afraid and they woke up Jesus who was sleeping and they said, save us Lord, we are perishing. Jesus replied, why are you so afraid? You have little faith. And then he calmed the storm. And the disciples were amazed that even the winds and waves obeyed him. Our Lord is the Lord of the universe, the Lord over the storms and pandemics. So as God's chosen one and beloved, he will never abandon us. In fact, our life is hidden with Christ in God. God promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So knowing who we are in Christ, well, confidently, we can confidently trust in, in God, our Father's goodness and his sovereignty over all things. We can find peace in Christ because we are certain he's with us and we are in him. We are in unity and union with him. I cannot overemphasize this foundation truth, foundational truth of our identity in Christ, even though you may not be consciously aware of it. Our identity profoundly affects our emotions, our behaviors, and the choice we make. So embracing our new identity in Christ gives us a brand new perspective for how we live our lives. It lays the foundation for inside out approach for connecting our faith with life. We're not relying on rules and you know, do's and don'ts, but we respond to our Lord Jesus and his call with gratitude for him and what he has done for us. So with this foundation of our new uh, identity in Christ established, let's take a look at the second practice of being heavenly minded to set our hearts and minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Here verse one says, seek or set your hearts on the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Then verse two adds, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. What does it mean to set our hearts and minds on the things that are above and not on the things on earth? Does it mean you always think about you know, what heaven is like and never think about your business, work, school, or family? That's not what it means. Rather, it means that your mind knows that you are in Christ and he's in you. Not that your life is here and Christ is somewhere up there. So being heavenly minded also means that you look at things from a biblical perspective, not a worldly perspective. So how do we do that? Let me suggest 
two ways to practice being heavily minded in our daily life. First, no matter what you are involved in, being with your family, doing your work, or facing a challenge, or solving a problem, remind yourself that Christ is there with you. You include the person of the Lord himself, knowing that he is with you. His wisdom, his power, his knowledge are all available. You may simply pause briefly to thank him for being you know, ever present with you, or listen and ask him to guide you in moments of need, such as you know, finding the right word to say uh, to, uh, in a tough uh, conversation, or solving uh, a technical problem, or making a good decision in a complex uh, situation. So think, remind yourself that Christ is there with you. Another way to practice setting our hearts and minds on the things that are above is to meditate on God's word. <clears throat> the best way to connect faith with life is to keep God's word in our heart and our minds so that it can be a lamp to our feet and light to our path. Just as you know, we heard from last Sunday's message, we need to meditate on and be rooted in God's word. Here in the verse 16 of today's passage also says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So if we have the word of Christ drawing us, then our thoughts and our everyday activities will be much more easily tied to Christ. So now how can we be heavenly minded as we face COVID-19 threat? We need to first check what our hearts and minds are focused on. As we face an uncertain future, are we focused on Jesus, on his love and his word? Or are we earthly minded and focused on the problem and the overwhelming media reports? Is our focus on the panic or on the calm that we have by the Lord's grace? So setting your heart and minds on things above, not on things that are on earth, means that we choose not to live in fear, but choose to draw on who Jesus is and the promises in God's word. Over the years, I have memorized a few uh, short uh, Bible passages. They often pop up naturally in my mind when I think of God. Psalm uh, 23 is one of them. And there are also a few familiar hymns and songs I know by heart. The psalm, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, that we just sang earlier is one of them. If I go to sleep or wake up in the middle of the night, these psalms, and Bible verses often come to my mind. And I seem or recite myself to sleep. You may want to try it, as they have brought me peace over the years. The second practice of integrating faith in life is that, you know, this passage uh, teaches us is to set our hearts and minds on the things above to think of our union with Christ and to keep God's word in our hearts. Then the third practice of integrating faith with life on this passage is to put off the old self with its practices and to put on the new self. This passage has a sequence of key transitional words and phrases that make the verses interconnected and interdependent. Note in verse one, if then, it says, if then you have been raised with Christ, then if then makes seeking the things that above a natural way of life, because we are united with Christ and Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So since we have been raised with Christ, then seeking the things that are above is a natural way of life. 
And then here, you know, similarly in verse two to four, know the conjunction four. For your old self already died, so don't set your mind on things that, that are on earth. Then note the transition, uh, therefore, <coughs> in verse five. It presumes that the two pre previous principles of knowing who you are in Christ and setting your heart and minds on the things above have been practiced. Pra practices, pra practiced. <laughs> Otherwise, we cannot put the, the, the death, put to death these earthly things, such as you know, uh, sexual immorality, lust, and greed. And also note the transition, but now in verse eight, verse seven describes how the old, how the uh, old self lived. But now, but now you are no longer your old self. You have been made new. So you must put anger and wrath and malice away. And then verse 12, note the phrase, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. As we see ourselves as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, our hearts find joy, peace, and love. It leads us to relate to others in a new way with compassion, kindness, and humility that springs from our hearts. And we also notice it is interesting that Paul uses the metaphor of the changing of changing clothes to illustrate how we change our identity with the associated attitude, emotions, and practices. In Paul's days, clothing represents a person's identity. I think it's also true in our days, but maybe to a lesser extent. For example, royalty wears the royal uh, clothing. Military personnel uh, wear their uniforms. Priests uh, wear their uh, clerical uh, clothing. Prisoners will wear jumpsuits. Paul is saying, you know, you are no longer the old you, a slave to sin. You are now sons and daughters of God, holy and beloved. So putting off the old self with its practice, like putting off your old clothes and putting on the new person created in Christ. And we should note from verse 10 that, you know, it says both putting off and putting on is a continuous moment by moment practice. It is not a one-time deal. We are continually putting on our new person in the process of being renewed in the, in the knowledge and image of the creator. And just like uh, Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So how do we uh, practice putting off the old self with its practices and putting on the new self? How do we put to death what is earthly in us? The practice of putting off and putting on is simply the practice of repentance. So whenever we catch ourselves doing things out of our flesh, whenever the Holy Spirit prompts us, prompts us with his gentle nudge, we need to make a turn. We turn away from the attitude, lust, and practice of the old self that are described in uh, you know, in, in described in verse 5 8, and put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and practice that God called us to have. So, how does this um, put off and put on practice look like as we're under the shelter in place? Your family members are stuck stuck you know together for all day long for a couple of day, for a couple of weeks and, and can can get on one another's nerve. It can be challenging and frustrating. In the past week I have become the main chef at home. I like to saute food and make it more flavorful. CK is more 
health conscious and she likes a more light taste. So a couple days ago, she said, why do you use so much oil when cooking? And you added too much spice and salt. My first reaction was, I was going to say something like, hey, I'm cooking now. When you were doing, you, doing the cooking, I didn't say anything. But before I reacted, another thought came across my mind. She's saying this for my own good. I know this was not from, from me because just like everyone else, I don't like to be told what to do. This is the nature of our old self. So I paused and turned around and said, okay, I'll try to remember to put less oil and salt. This might sound like, a, like an insignificant example of putting off the old self with the practice and then putting on the new self. Maybe you have some bigger issues and conflicts at home. That means you have a bigger opportunity to practice putting off and putting on. I encourage you to pray about what specific changes God wants you to make in your relationship with your family members. What old habits, attitudes, and earthly behavior do you need to put off? Ask God to help you to begin to replace it with a new attitude and behavior that is fitting for your new self in Christ. Remember that you have died with Christ, then you have been raised with him. Remember that Christ is living in you through the Holy Spirit. But don't be discouraged if you uh, fail or stumble. Just keep on practicing what is taught in this passage. And as we take heart who we are in Christ, and as we practice putting off the old and putting on the new, we have been renewed and been conformed more and more to the image of Christ. So here are the three uh, uh, practices we talked about to help us to integrate faith with life. First, embrace your new identity in Christ. Second, set your heart and minds to the things that are above. Third, put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self. Well, no, things don't change overnight. Integrating faith with life is a daily practice, a moment-by-moment -moment process. So let's encourage one another to share our experience and learn from one another. Just as the as second half of the verse uh, 16 says, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. As we continue to practice together, we can better integrate faith with life and we will experience and live out what it says in verse 17. Whatever you do, in words or deeds, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us and saving us through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for cre creating us new in Christ. We struggle with integrating faith and life. We need your help. So please help us. Help us to grasp our true identity in Christ, to set our hearts and minds on the things that are above, and always be ready to repent, to put off the old self with its practices and put on a new self. Help us to practice what we have, we have heard and learned so we can integrate faith with life and live out our faith in our everyday lives for your girl. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.